Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a dental receptionist and a patient. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello, Mr. Budley. Is that your treatment finished for today? Yes, I've just had the x-ray for now. The dentist asked me to make another appointment to have one out and then to get my teeth cleaned. OK, let's have a look at what's available. I've got a couple of free slots next week on the 16th. That's the Wednesday. Monday and Tuesday are completely full, I'm afraid. Isn't there anything sooner than that? I'm in a lot of pain. Nothing this week? I'm afraid not. We're very busy this week. One of the dentists is away on holiday, so we're a little short-staffed. If someone cancels, I'll give you a call. But for the time being, shall I book you in for the 16th? We have a free slot at 1.30 and another one at 3.30. OK. Can you book me in at 3.30? Let me uh, make a note of that. Um, oh, hang on. I can't make 3.30. I've got a meeting at 4 and I'll never get back in time. It'll have to be 1.30. Before you hear more of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Right, that's booked for you. Now, the extraction will be £90 and the x-ray is £20, so that's £110 altogether. How would you like to pay? Cash or cheque? I'm afraid we don't take cards. I'll pay by cheque, thanks. If it's OK, I'll pay for the x-ray now and the rest at my next appointment, just in case I have to cancel for any reason. That'll be fine. Just to let you know, we need at least 24 hours' notice if you have to cancel, Otherwise, there's a £10 fee. So, the cheque. Who shall I make it payable to? Sinclair Dental Surgeons. That's S-I-N-C-L-A-I-R. While I'm here, I was wondering whether you had any information about dental insurance. I think my teeth are beginning to show signs of age, and I might need a lot more treatment. Uh, there's a company we work with. Here's one of their leaflets. Their prices are very competitive, and the cover they offer is similar to that of most other companies. They pay up to £650 a year for dental treatment, and you can add your wife and children to the plan whenever you want with their family cover plan. This gives you a generous discount compared to individual plans. Mm, thanks. It looks interesting. And they offer interest-free monthly payments too. Uh, there's a telephone number you can call for more information. Thanks. I'll take it home and have a closer read. Will I be able to claim for the treatment I'm having now? Any treatment you have after your membership starts will be covered. So if you're quick, you might get the cost of work next week covered. Thanks again. Well, I'll see you next week then. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2 You will hear a presenter on a radio show. The presenter is talking to the organiser of an arts festival. First, you have some time to look at question 11 to 17. Hi again. I'm joined today by Ben Knightley from the Media and Arts Centre. He's here to tell us about the launch of the city's arts festival. Hi, Ben. This year has a particular focus, doesn't it? It does, yes. This year, we want to encourage more people who would not normally describe themselves as being creative to get involved with some of our many events and workshops. Not simply turning up as spectators, but to get involved themselves, to get their hands dirty, as it were. There's such a wide offering this year that I'm sure we'll have something to suit all tastes. You were telling me earlier how beneficial being creative can be for us. Absolutely. I recently attended a drawing workshop and, uh, even if I do say so myself, came away with a very good sketch I'd done. But what was particularly surprising for me was my feeling of pride and joy when I looked at the sketch again and showed it to the family. It really took me back to the feelings I had as a youngster when I'd made something. I realised that, even as an adult, we can get just as much pleasure and happiness from creative activity. Actually, research has shown that the more we allow ourselves to be creative, the happier we feel. And the more positive our frame of mind, the more creative and the more curious we become about the world we live in. Well, you've certainly persuaded me. So what kind of events can we look forward to? We want to try and include as wide a range of people as possible this year, from people already involved in the creative arts through to elderly people who haven't been creative in years. So, for example, we're inviting people in the creative industries who occasionally suffer from writer's block to join us on one of our creative walks. Walking has been proved to aid creative thinking, and we're running a series of walks during the spring and summer around some of the many beauty spots in and around the city. Then there's our knitting programme. We're working with schools in the area to invite grandparents in to teach kids how to knit. It's a great opportunity to bridge the generation gap and rekindle that interest in knitting you may have forgotten about. We also aim to inspire and support people without jobs through a series of free courses, starting with creative writing workshops. These courses will give them an insight into the basic ingredients of a good short story and help participants get their ideas into shape. And for anyone out there who is looking for the chance to explore their creative side, come along to our printmaking workshops. You'll have the chance to study some fantastic prints by local artists, explore different print processes, and take home a print of your own to hang on a wall. Before you hear the rest of the radio show, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Excellent. So how do we go about getting involved? If anyone is interested in joining one of these sessions, it's important that you contact us first, as places need to be booked beforehand. We ran similar sessions last year and demand was high. As I said previously, there's no charge for any of the workshops and materials where appropriate will be provided on the day. You can get further information on our website, and if you don't have access to the internet, call us on 514-2261. The booking office is open Monday to Friday from 9 to 5, but closes early on a Saturday at 12.30. Many thanks, Ben.
That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between two university students about transferring to a different course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hi, Graham. How are you doing? Hi, Judy. I'm fine, thanks. And thanks for popping round. I was hoping I could pick your brains about transferring to another course. Yes, I remember you saying you wanted to do something else. Are you planning on staying here, or are you looking to go to a different university? No, I'm happy to stay here. I just feel I need to do something else. How did you go about your transfer? You did History of Art originally, didn't you? That was the course I initially wanted to transfer to. I'd studied art at college and wanted to continue, but my parents persuaded me that English would be more useful, so I took their advice. But I really didn't enjoy it and tried to transfer to History of Art, but the course was full. Anyway, I spoke with the course tutors and they told me about the fine art programme. They thought I had the talent to do it, so that was that. I see. How did your parents take the news? They were OK about it, really. They just want me to do what I enjoy, so everything's fine there. So you're hoping to transfer as well then? Yes, I think I've given the German course a good try, but I'm not really happy. Most of the other students on the course seem to have at least one German parent, or they've spent a great deal of time in Germany, so their German is much better than mine. We get huge novels to read, and I'm still struggling with the first chapter while they're already finished and writing their assignments. I thought about doing a combined degree, German with another course, as the workload would be less, but in the end, I feel a complete change would be best. One of my other subjects at school was history, and I realise now I'm actually more interested in that. One of my housemates is doing history, and it sounds like a great degree, so I've decided to focus on that. Well, people do transfer, so it's not out of the ordinary. But won't you miss the opportunity to study abroad for a year? You spend year three in Germany, don't you? I know. Not only Germany, actually. You have a choice of Germany, Switzerland or Austria. That would be exciting, I know. But that's really the only thing I like about the course. And I can always do some travelling after I've finished my studies. I still don't know what I want to do as far as a career is concerned, so I think it's best I study something I enjoy first and foremost. Anyway, I thought I'd ask you about how you went about your transfer before taking it any further. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, the first thing you have to do is make sure you're clear in your own mind why you want to transfer. You'll need to persuade people that it's a good idea, so get your arguments clear. Then, I'm sure you've already done this, but check what the entry requirements are for history and whether you've got the necessary qualifications. 
They might be more flexible now you're actually here, but you need to show them you'd be able to keep up with your studies. Well, I've got history qualifications, so I'm hoping that won't be a problem. Who do I have to speak to? Well, they always tell you to speak with your course tutor first, in case there's a way of making the course you're on more appealing to you. But it sounds like you've definitely decided to get out, so I'd go to the careers service next, just to make sure there aren't any restrictions on transferring. It shouldn't be a problem, but it's best to check first. And then there's your funding. I'm no expert, but I would imagine this won't be a problem. German's a four-year course and history is three, so you could just start from year one next September. If the career service think it's OK and there are no funding problems, go and speak to the admissions tutor in the history department, just to see if they're happy with your qualifications and if there are places. OK. Well, I'm hoping it'll be OK. I'm planning to transfer at the beginning of next year rather than halfway through this year. Yes, hopefully it'll be all right. If they accept you, it's pretty straightforward after that. It's not like you're going to another university. You just have to complete a form. I think it's called an internal transfer form. Your current head of department and the one for the course you're transferring to have to add their signature as well, and that's it. Well, thanks for that, Judy. I'd better start making my case for transferring, I suppose. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a psychological condition called synesthesia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to look at a fascinating condition that challenges the idea that we all see and experience the world around us in a similar way. For example, what do you see when I mention a day of the week or a month? What colour is the letter A or the number 10? If you often find yourself having more than the normal sense sensations, you too could have a condition known as synesthesia. Synesthesia is a harmless but fascinating condition which is often described by psychologists as the joining of the senses. We normally experience our senses individually, so we see a colour or hear a word, whereas people with synesthesia will find two or more senses being stimulated at the same time by a single stimulus. Some people will see or feel a colour when they hear a sound. Others will experience a taste or smell when another sense is stimulated. This happens automatically. The sensation can't be managed. People often go through life unaware that they have the condition. A common response from individuals who learn for the first time that they have synesthesia is one of surprise to discover that other people don't experience the same thing. It's a normal part of life for them, and they will rarely describe the symptoms negatively. To estimate the numbers of people with synesthesia, one group of researchers sat people in front of a computer and showed them letters and numbers in black. 
Participants were asked to choose a colour for each character they saw. A small proportion of participants, namely those with synesthesia, consistently described the same characters as having the same colours. On the basis of the results, researchers were able to predict that synesthesia affects about 1% of the population. This number has been confirmed in other research. Synesthesia takes many different forms, but the most common is to see or feel a colour in relation to letters and numbers. It's commonplace for people to identify A with red, B with blue and so on. Some people will actually see a colour, but in most cases it's a question of feeling or sensing the colour. However, it's just as commonplace to see days, months, letters and numbers spatially, that is in lines or circles for example. People might say they see Monday up high, Tuesday just below Monday, Wednesday on the left, Thursday on the right and so on. This doesn't mean that people with synesthesia always agree on what they sense. Two synesthetes will often argue over the colour of a letter, for example. But patterns emerge if a large enough sample of people are observed, providing clear evidence of this condition despite individual variations. Colour and spatial synesthesia are amongst the most common forms of the condition, but they are by no means the only way people experience it. One of the more interesting combinations is word-taste synesthesia. This occurs when words lead the person to experience tastes or certain taste sensations, so a person's name might have the flavour of a particular sweet. Places might be associated with the taste of particular snacks. Taste needs to be seen in a wider context here. The sensation may be a feeling on the tip of the tongue or at the back of the throat and will differ from person to person. Some researchers believe we are all born with the condition and that it's most prevalent in our early years, but it then tends to become less noticeable as we enter childhood. It's a fascinating thought that as infants we experience the world around us through our senses in a different way than as adults. However, testing this hypothesis will be challenging, bearing in mind the difficulty of getting feedback from young infants. Research also points to the fact that synesthesia runs in families. In fact, as many as 40% of synesthetes, as they are called, know of someone in the family with a similar condition. This won't necessarily be a close family member, and the condition may be traceable back to previous generations, or to an extended family member such as a cousin or uncle. There is evidence that synesthetes are often creative, and will often have artistic hobbies or interests. Researchers think this is not necessarily because synesthesia makes them naturally more talented in this area, but the fact that they have multiple sensory experiences generates an interest in, for example, art or music. So, that's synesthesia. Apart from its intrinsic interest, for psychologists it's a fascinating indication that we may all experience the world around us in different ways. Once upon a time, these findings would have been regarded as highly subjective, lacking evidence and not of any scientific worth. However, we now have a much greater interest in how the brain helps us make sense of the world, and the study of synesthesia is one way for us to discover more about this. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.
Hey there, future ILTS master. Let's dive straight into the heart of acing your ILTS reading section with some killer time management tips. I know the clock ticking down can really crank up the pressure, but with these strategies, you'll be breezing through those paragraphs like a pro. First up, skim and scan, your best friends in the reading test. Start by skimming through the text to get the gist of it. This isn't the time to ponder over every word. Catch the main ideas and move on. Then scan for specific information to answer the questions quickly. Remember, it's like being a detective, looking for clues without getting bogged down in unnecessary details. Now let's talk about dividing your time. The reading section is a tight race against the clock. So here's a golden rule. Spend no more than 20 minutes on each passage. Start with the passage that seems easiest to you to build confidence and momentum. This strategy helps in managing your mental energy as well, saving your brain power for more challenging tasks later. And don't forget, practice makes perfect. Regularly timing yourself while practicing can drastically improve your test day performance. Try simulating exam conditions at home. It's like a rehearsal for the main event. The more you practice, the better you get at gauging how much time to spend on different types of questions. Lastly, if you're stuck on a question, don't let it steal your time. Mark it, move on, and come back to it if time allows. It's crucial not to get trapped by tricky questions that could eat up your valuable minutes. So there you have it. Skim and scan, wisely divide your time, practice under timed conditions, and don't get bogged down. Implement these tips and watch your ELTS reading score soar. Good luck, and remember, you've got this.